my job is to provide context for this evening. Now, giving the history of notorious criminal trials is actually quite difficult because it's a very hard to define term. So I will instead narrow my focus to the kinds of cases that we're going to be discussing in the panel discussion. Not just notorious cases, but notorious cases of the realm of what is known as organized crime. That, by the way, is Dutch Schultz, real name Arthur Flegenheimer, who may or may not be related to one of my coworkers. We're still working it out. A famous mobster of the 1920s or 30s lurking outside of the federal courthouse of the Southern District of New York on the eve of his trial. Um, Organized crime is itself a very big subject, so my job is to provide context, assuming for the moment that everyone in the room knows the standard beats, the things we've heard a thing or two about. Prohibition, big media portrayals, wide-brimmed hats, and similar kinds of concepts. And while organized crime is by no means a uniquely New York phenomenon, far from it, New York and New York City in particular provided an environment where graft, rackets, black markets, corruption, extortion, and contraband could flourish in a high-density, bustling economic epicenter of culture and trade. So with that, we start where we must. What is it? Um, and thank you, Internet Clip Art, for providing all sorts of wonderful images. Um, it turns out there's a lively debate among lawyers and scholars about how best to define organized crime. And the best way to show the debate, um, the sort of germ of the debate, is to look at two federal definitions. So on one end, the FBI has a very broad definition of organized crime, defining it as any group having some manner of a formalized structure and whose primary objective is to obtain money through illegal activities fairly straightforward. However, in a 1968 statute, which I note contains one of the rare definitions of organized crime that you actually find in the Federal Criminal Code, organized crime suddenly becomes highly organized, disciplined associations engaged in supplying illegal goods and services. Thus the dilemma. We have a broad versus specific tension to how abstract we want to define the term. Too general, and we get crime that is organized, which is kind of tautological, right? It doesn't really tell us much. Examples of this could be crimes like insider trading, coordinated Medicare fraud, something where clearly people are working in concert with each other, but not generally considered by scholars and lawyers to be organized crime. On the other hand, we can get too specific, transnational drug cartels and only those drug cartels. And by the way, that's an actual uh, Halloween costume, and if you want to get it for your kids and have them carrying around fake guns, fine by me. Um, to, in order to avoid this dichotomy, which ends up wasting a lot of time in trying to figure out your definitions, many scholars, such as University of Illinois professor Michael Maltz, suggest that instead of looking at polar figures, we look for certain factors in determining whether criminal activity is organized crime. And as it turns out, there's consensus on several of these. Major factors, which occur in most cases, include things like corruption, violence, and connections with legitimate enterprises, such as business and politics. Plus factors, which you don't see all the time, but which are kind of the flavor enhancers of organized crime, if you will, include sophistication, discipline, ideology, bonding, the kind of our gang elements that make the uh, 1968 definition sound the way it does. So with these factors in hand, we can actually move to um, some of the era Judge Rosenblatt was talking about before, and one of the classic historical examples of early organized crime in the Americas and New York, and it's not something that everyone thinks of when they think of organized crime. Pirates and the, the ship kind. Um, and we're going to mine this vein for a while because everyone loves pirates. Pirates are, to quote Professor Stephen Mallory, hierarchical, with restricted membership, ample opportunities for corruption and illegality, and more on which in a second, and with a distinct profit-seeking motive, to put it mildly. They fit into both the FBI's narrower definition and fall safely within the crime that is organized plus. By most scholarly accounts, they make the grade. And even before New York was New York, the piracy corruption connection was very well established. Colonial Governor Benjamin Fletcher, pictured here, was in office from 1692 to 1697 and was happy to offer pirates safe haven so long as he was paid. Privateering codes allowed for some state-sanctioned legal piracy so long as certain procedures were followed, but Fletcher's pals generally dispense with illegal niceties. And we've got a lovely quote here from the amazing book, which I highly encourage you to check out, Gotham, A History of New York City. It talks about protection money, bribes, ostentatious displays of wealth, and has a very familiar ring. Now, several of the notorious pirates of this period were, in fact, tried in trials. 
But laws during this golden age of piracy generally set venue in England, so they were not generally tried in the United States, or the future in the United States, as it were. William Kidd, one such pirate, was in fact tried in England, and this is a, the cover of the pamphlet that was actually created to commemorate what happened at his trial. Now, as it turns out, several of the courts, both domestically and in Europe, that tried pirates strove for something approximating modern due process, at least in connection with duress. Pirates had to commit their acts voluntarily, but that created a giant loophole. People could claim they were conscripts, and since their actions were not willing, they were not pirates. I note, by the way, that while there are, in fact, some um, uh, future America colonial pirate trials, a lot of them weren't actually of piracy per se. For instance, one notorious trial of the pirate Joseph Andrews, which was notorious enough, by the way, to attract the attra uh, attention of then Governor Henry Moore, was actually based on something closer to mutiny, which very frequently got lumped in with piracy in the then common criminal codes. So here, for example, we see a, uh, an excerpt from a booklet of a 19th century piracy trial that was actually closer to mutiny. And I chose this image because of the absolutely wonderful text at the bottom. This depicts the scene of the crime, which was the blood-stained cabin of the oyster sloop, which is a sentence you just don't hear often enough. <laughs> Having shown the piratical roots of organized crime, we turn our attention to New York City itself. And as it happens, New York City provides an excellent case study in the formation and development of complex and or organized crime. Even before the 1898 unification of counties into the city that we know today, New York City was an epicenter of trade. It was very well positioned for that task. It sits in an easily accessible harbor, that much more so after the Erie Canal was built. The city was an early commercial center. And of course, it was a major uh, entry point for new immigrants, more on which in a little bit. The city sat an appreciable distance from the state's capital, which moved to Albany on the cusp of the 19th century, and its local government was, shall we say, somewhat colorful. Add crowding and lax regulation, and you get the perfect environment for the Ghanifs, confidence men, and extortion artists that come from that uh, quotation by C. Alexander Hortus. So let's focus, again, on New York City, but one particular aspect of that the port, and I am in get, again indebted to Mr. Hortis, whose book is just amazing on this point and from which I have borrowed somewhat liberally. Point one, money. The port of New York was the point of ingress and egress for half of the United States' international trade quite early on, and the items passing through the port tended to be exceptionally valuable, major opportunities for graft and corruption. Point two, opportunity. The port simply could not accommodate all of the traffic that was passing through it. There were tons of veto points, from railroads to space on sloops. People did an awful lot of time waiting for things to happen, which made it almost certain that palms would be greased. The third point is corruption. Now, unions and manufacturing shops were quite easily infiltrated, but the police force at the time was very large and decentralized, leaving ample opportunity for graft. Waterfront cops were alleged to be among some of the worst of the city, and payoffs were very easy. And corruption scandals accordingly occurred on almost a bi-decade basis. For instance, uh, a police captain and eventual police chief, William DeVere, um, pictured here in a very unflattering portrait, um, was in fact charged and was acquitted after his own notorious trial in 1896, which is profiled in a book called, appropriately, Island of Vice. But corruption in New York City was, of course, far bigger than the police. And as Judge Rosenblatt touched on some of these points, um, I won't go over, I won't re-go over that many of them. But Tammany Hall extorted millions from the public fisc. And as he mentioned, the courthouse bearing Boss Tweed's name was an incredible source of kickbacks and graft. Of course, Boss Tweed was the subject of several notorious trials. He was convicted in 1873 um, after one of them, although his sentence was partially overturned by the New York Court of Appeals on appeal. I note that he had some very high profile attorneys. One, in fact, that I'd like to um, highlight is Willard Bartlett, who is, in fact, a future New York Court of Appeals judge. Sometimes the only thing that prevented someone from being charged was, in fact, that they had the protection of Tammany Hall. So, just to cite one example, Monk Eastman, the notorious and, as it turned out, British leader of the 19th century Eastman gang, and Tammany Darling, was only tried once his protection from Tammany ran its course. So here's an uh, amazing little cartoon from Harper's, uh, no prison is big enough to hold the boss, it says. And this is actually the indictment of a judge who was connected with Tammany, um, his indictment for corruption. 
At this point, we move into the 20th century, and this is where those tropes I spoke of before start to become familiar. So we're gonna blaze through this point. The boroughs unify, as times changed, so did technology. Manhattan's new manufacturing jobs provided both uh, legitimate and illegal business opportunities um, with tons of room to expand. Enhancements in communication increased the sophistication and reach of criminal syndicates and allowed them to better evade authorities. And on the darker side, improvements in firearms and automobiles also allowed for syndicates enforcement wings to better improve the efficiency of reprisals and the ability to wage campaigns of inter-gang warfare. And it's very amusing to note that at the turn of the 20th century, the criminal bar actually thought its glory days were behind it. This is an article from the New York Times in, I believe, 1904 about um, how good times were over. And I note that, by the way, decadence here is used to mean uh, decline, although I'm sure they were also having fun on the side. Um, the 19th and 20th centuries also saw waves of new immigrants, and um, it's with that that we turn to a completely uncontroversial topic. It's difficult to talk about organized and complex crime without referring to race and ethnicity. Now, it is true that ethnicity made for some of the tightest bonds and some of the most enduring criminal syndicates of the period. That being said, a once popular theory of ethnic succession, the idea that criminal opportunities actually provided the mode of ingress for many um, immigrants of the period has been wildly disputed and is no longer as popular as it once was. But something very important takes the sting out of discussing the topic of ethnicity and organized crime, which is this. Everyone was in on it. Irish and Italian gangs fought for control over the best rackets in Five Points in the Docks. The 1910 criminal trial of the Morello crime family, which involved death threats sent to the judge, was one of the, the blockbuster uh, federal criminal trials of the period, resulting in much press attention. The turn of the century Tong Wars in Chinatown were epics in and of themselves, and in fact actually had many connections with Tammany Hall, as uh, seen in the slide. There were African American gangs in Harlem and parts of Brooklyn, and then there were my people. Jewish mobsters and gang leaders, some of the nastiest of the bunch, including Arnold Rothstein, who conspired to fix the World Series. Um, despite their notoriety and their viciousness during this period, it turns out that books written on these characters often sort of result of familiar tropes. Um, some, some things you just can't run away from, apparently. Um, this, is, this is a real thing. Um, once we get into the Prohibition era, I feel like people mostly know the drill, so I will be brief. Bootlegging the Roaring Twenties, the aforementioned broad brim tats, additional opportunities for corruption and graft, new criminal organizations taking over from old ones, technology and sophistication of that technology continuing to increase. In the 1930s, racketeering became the order of the day. And New York City actually began a war on racketeers, ramping up with the appointment of Thomas Dewey as special prosecutor. And we have a quick excerpt over here of a trial transcript from the trial of one Dopey Benny Fine, a gangster who was heavily involved in racketeering and was finally prosecuted in the 1940s. After li liquor prohibition ran its course, drug prohibition became the order of the day. And one of the major myths is that many of the criminal syndicates that existed before steered clear of drug trafficking. This turns out to not be true. There was quite a bit of drug trafficking by established criminal syndicates, and they were lured into this, among other things, by the incredibly low penalties, in grand contrast to today, that drug trafficking often took. 1960s through today, in other words, 50-some um, odd years of history in about 45 seconds, we have the advent of RICO laws, which are anti-racketeering laws, and increased federal-state cooperation and coordination in the context of prosecuting organized crime. In fact, the Pizza Connection mob case is something I'd like to highlight. The longest criminal trial in history in the 1980s, the result of an extraordinary amount of cooperation between federal, state, and in fact, international law enforcement authorities. At that time, the FBI, after the death of J. Edgar Hoover, also changed tack to focus on organized crime. And that brings us more or less into today and the panel discussion you're about to see. Um, increase of sophistication both in the context of the organized crime uh, rings themselves, but also in the context of the official response to organized crime. And with that, you have context. Back to you, Judge Rosenblatt. Okay, good. <laughs>